Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. Architect Abu Zarim, PAM Deputy President and also the Chairman of CPD Committee, PAM Council members, PAM members, PAM CPD Committee members, Secretariat staff, and also Garis Pizza, who is providing the technical support for this uh, CPD online program. Welcome to this virtual session of PAM CPD Unlimited. Two years ago, in November 2019, we had our first CPD Unlimited for the first time. I was invited by, by architect Juan Sofia, uh, the coordinator uh, for the CPD Unlimited 2019 program uh, to present a paper. Regret that I have to decline the invitation because it clashes with uh, my another program, the, the ninth annual development conference in uh, Singapore where I was invited to present a paper together with our Minister of Housing and Local Government, YB Zuraida Kamaluddin. I was informed by architect Wan Sofia that the session in KL was well attended and there were minor issues on car parking space and room availability when we did the physical session two years ago. Time allocated for speakers were too short, some couldn't finish the session before the following session starts in the same room. So initially, architect Abu Zarim, the CPD chairman, planned to have physical CPD unlimited program on 15 December last year. Um, but due to the pandemic, then we have to postpone to 9 of January 2021. But again, the MCO was also extended several times affecting our schedule. Finally, we have decided to have, this, uh, to have this session online. So today, this session will be conducted fully online uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic and this SOP that we have to comply with. I hope this virtual session eliminates the problem that we had before. No more car parking problem, no more room availability problem, but Please be prepared and tolerate with us. Uh, with this virtual session, speakers are everywhere. They are at home, in their office, and some are at PEM Center. So we are running multiple sessions concurrently. It is uh, stretching uh, the internet bandwidth that we have. But we have our technical team uh, on standby. So uh, we are experimenting this virtual CPD Unlimited for the first time. There are many things that we will learn from this session. Speaking on learning, I hope participants will learn new things from this program today. Under this pandemic and economic challenges, it is like racing. Every day we have to learn and get the new knowledge. Otherwise, we'll be left behind. We are happy to have our speakers willing to share their knowledge and new technologies with us today. I am glad that we have architect Razin Mahmoud. He will be sharing his journey, small team with big dream. And we also have Dato' architect Saifu Anwar Aziz. He will be sharing his experience as a sole proprietor exporting services overseas. And of course, our special, special guest Dato Sri, Engineer Zaini Ujang from Ministry of Environment and Water. He will be talking about eco shift in built environment. We also have Taufik Nazaruddin, Nohayati Ahmad uh, speaking about digital solution and Internet of Things. We also have Associate Professor Dr. Ahmad Tamizi uh, from UMP Holding. He will be speaking on BIM organization transformation. And we have uh, architect Gary Wong also talking about BIM today. And other than that, we have many more speakers on various topics. On fire safety design, we have architect Chong Lee Siong, engineer Hao Jiang Te. On construction contract related subjects, we have architect Joseph Tan, architect Lu Chi Kiong. We also have David Ye. We'll be talking about um, mediation and dispute resolution. We also have the topics on conservation by Mariana Issa, 
Mangcik Kau, Arkitek Rida Razak and Ahmad Naji Arifin and also on Urban Design by Associate Professor Dr. Sharifah Salwa. I will not be able uh, to say uh, all, to mention all the names, but there are many more speakers. You can check with the program. And later in my session, I will also share the finding from our survey uh, from the government agencies, developers, contractors, and individual project owners on what do they expect from architects in providing architecture services. Recently, we have conducted a survey uh, to get the feedback uh, from developers, contractors, and also government agency on uh, their expectation on architects' uh, services. And uh, on behalf of PAM, I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here virtually today. This is our first ever virtual CPD unlimited program. Please give us feedback at the end of the session so that we will improve things in the future. I hope that all participants will enjoy this session and have a good interaction with the speakers. Make sure you interact with the speaker. Don't just leave your computer on, but you are not there. So enjoy the session. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you. Ibu kindly unmute your your speaker, please. Your speak your 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 microphone, please unmute. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon, Dato. Uh, Alvin. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, okay. Uh, 
Welcome everyone to uh, CPD uh, program with the title of Heritage and Historic Architecture Conservation and Digital Technology. Uh, before we start, let me introduce myself. My name is Abdul Muluk bin Abdul Manan. I'm from currently with uh, University Tunku Abdul Rahman. I'm also sit in the PAM Council. And uh, today we are honored to have uh, two uh, distinguished speakers on this topic, which is Dato Architect Zulkifli, uh, Zulkhairi and Architect Alvin. So, uh, uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dato Zul first. Correct? Or is it Alvin first? Want to speak first? Unmute your mic, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Dato Zul? Me, the floor so. is yours. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon to um, uh, the moderator, uh, architect Haji Mulu. Uh, Haji Mulu, eh? Okay. Uh, how are you today? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, a very nice bamboo uh, photos uh, behind <laughs> you. Uh, uh, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, I'm, I thank um, uh, M for inviting me uh, to uh, give a, a brief talk uh, for today's session. About twenty minutes. Not much we can say, but I try my best to deliver uh, uh, the information that uh, I need to share. And uh, thank you to um, the president, Pan President, CPD Chairman and all the participants uh, who uh, have been uh, in this uh, program, I think since this morning, yeah? shifting rooms. All right, okay, uh, let me share my screen. Um, okay, so my uh, presentation today is about the heritage and historic architecture conservation and the digital technologies uh, that, that uh, we have uh, in the market today. And uh, I'm uh, just a brief introduction. Eh? I'm a co chairman of uh, Heritage uh, Conservation Committee of M and uh, used to be uh, deputy president of uh, e commerce Malaysia. Um, okay, uh, I think uh, the rest of it uh, is already uh, introduced eh, by architect Anulo just now. Okay, now I would I'd like to go to uh, straight away to the topic there. Okay, so firstly, I just want to have uh, some uh, overview on the heritage and historic architecture conservation. Eh? So what gives a city or town a character and a sense of community is the history of it. Yeah, so the history of it. And that's why we conserve buildings. You know, one way of acknowledging this history is conserving the heritage the historic building and structures so why do we conserve okay one is maybe because of the particular style of architecture of, uh, Dato, uh, may I interrupt? of the Dato, city uh, Dato, yeah. can you hear me mm. uh, can you change your view to yeah, yeah. Uh, presentation view because we can see you in a format of a powerpoint Presentation view. Oh, okay. Let me see. Me. Wait, wait. Yeah. Ada button, what? Yeah. Ini slide ni ya. Okay. Are you okay now? Yes. Are you okay? Thank you, Dato. Okay, uh, uh, you, I can hear you very clearly. I, I'm not sure whether you can hear me or not. Uh, we can hear you. Yes, I thought you were very loud and clear. Okay, okay. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we conserve because of the particular style of architecture uh, uh, of the city or because of uh, the, the quality of the buildings. You know, like uh, today, 
we are building using concrete bricks and uh, some uh, commonly found uh, material, not metals, eh? material actually. So uh, by preserving or conserving old building, historian uh, can study the essence of the building and creation, the past of human activity. So, okay, many of the materials uses, used for old buildings uh, built before 1900 or, or early 1900 use, uh, they use a very superior material. For example, uh, timber, they use uh, cengal, merbau, and rasa uh, for building material like beam, joist, uh, floor, and doors. And it can withstand weather and time and some of them uh, can last until uh, 100 years um, uh, we can see it in, in some of the old uh, mosques uh, like um, the one uh, in, in Kelantan or uh, some in, in, uh, in Patani 300 years old mosque yeah so the timber use is still uh, strong Okay, uh, okay, uh, here we can see uh, a, an aerial view of a, a part of the city. This is uh, uh, Alusta, eh? part of Alusta, uh, taken about uh, five years ago. You can see uh, the buildings, uh, the uh, in front of uh, Masjid uh, Zahir, Masjid Zahir on the right hand side, and you can see the river there, and you can see the fabric of the town with uh, Chinatown and Malay Town at the back in the foreground, and uh, Balai Besar on the left, and also uh, lots of other uh, historic buildings, and also uh, you can see the Padang. There or the dataran with um, with a beautiful uh, water fountain uh, created in 1984, uh, more than 30 years ago. Okay, and then this uh, the the building that I crop in the foreground is the uh, Balai Seni Negeri, uh, built uh, around 1905, and uh, most of the material used for the building is still good, intact and uh, the conservation work for this padang the rejuvenating of this padang was done by me and my company together with uh, uh, some other consultants so okay next video uh, next slide okay the third uh, reason for conservation uh, is uh, a tourist uh, attraction so many uh, tourists come to a place, you know, to see all these uh, uh, the heritage parts of the city, you know, and then uh, old buildings uh, really attracts uh, tourists yeah, to uh, have a look at how people in the olden days live, uh, how their lifestyle is, you know, like uh, in Penang, in Georgetown, where the heritage uh, part of Georgetown, you can see. Uh, buildings uh, using uh, granite blocks very big blocks and clay roof style so those are the things that attracts tourists that will boost economy okay and also the imperfections of old buildings are something uh, something that tourists are attracted to as well you know and the fourth consideration uh, is about the environmental consideration eh? preserving old buildings it's like a recycling on a larger scale. Okay, so we repair and reuse the building. We adaptively reuse the building from old shop houses uh, to uh, hotels, you know, in, in Penang, a lot of it. And also in Malacca, um, in Kuala Lumpur as well. Yeah, so uh, the fourth reason. And the fifth reason uh, for conserving uh, the uh, old building is uh, is that once you remove the building, you will never uh, bring it back, you know, to its original uh, sense. Yeah? 
So like uh, I'll go back one step. This is the old uh, Istana Mazia in um, in uh, in Negeri Sembilan. It's not far from the uh, the iconic um, uh, Istana. Uh, what do you call that Istana? Istana Sri Menanti. So just next to it, not far from it. But this is the first one. Yeah, this is the the, the first Istana. Uh, built in Sri Okay, uh, so we go to the next one. Okay, uh, this is uh, a photo of uh, Stadium Merdeka. Um, it's a, it is surrounded by a new development. As you can see, lots of cranes, a tower crane behind it. And you can see uh, KL Tower. So the development uh, all around it has threatened its existence there. You know, uh, if we go for a closer look, maybe you can see lots of cracks here and there, and uh, lots of other things that we need, that need intervention uh, by the authority or the stakeholder of this uh, uh, stadium. And this stadium has uh, a very uh, important, um, it's very significant in the development of modern Malaysia is where uh, in one of the events uh, our Tunku Abdul Rahman has declared independence here yeah uh, a series of declarations this is one of the places uh, that has been used yeah, for that uh, historic event so this building is worth uh, uh, conserve yeah you can see uh, if you study the the uh, the history of how they built it, how long it takes, the material use at that time, this is marvelous. So this is something that uh, we need to do something before it's gone. Okay. Um, all right. So for heritage, uh, the heritage conservation, there's a lot of issues, eh? issues and challenges, especially in managing the heritage and the historic asset. So historic assets uh, in this sense is uh, buildings, eh? buildings and structures. So some of the uh, process in uh, managing the uh, heritage uh, asset uh, is uh, the first one is identification of the asset. First, you identify whether this asset is worth uh, conserving. Yeah, and the second one you have to do documentation. Documentation is for you to prepare a document uh, so that you uh, you can uh, study the um, the the condition of the the, the buildings or the, the structures, you know, or the sites uh, around it, and also that documentation will be used for later if you want to nominate it uh, into a heritage list. Yeah. Uh, with Jabatan Waisan Negara, the X245, uh, Heritage X. And after that, after whether it's nominated or not, one is considered as heritage uh, asset, then we have to manage it. So how we manage it, that is uh, something that we uh, are not going to discuss here. Uh, but uh, uh, it's worth mentioning that managing the asset is, has to be done uh, properly. Yeah? Um, Conservation management plan has to be there so that uh, you have the blueprint on how to uh, manage the asset. Otherwise, uh, the the conserved building will uh, deteriorate, you know, uh, very fast. Okay, because uh, like uh, I quoted uh, Professor Gaffa from USM. He always like uh, to say to his students and the, the audience that uh, heritage asset is like an old lady or your grandma. You know, you have to to uh, treat it uh, very uh, nicely, slowly, because she's so delicate. You know, you cannot uh, touch her uh, uh, like you were doing it to an older, uh, a younger person. You have to do it very slowly nicely you know okay and then from time to time we have to examine and reassess 
the outcome of the management, whether we have done it right or we have done it, we, we, we further uh, damaging the, the asset. As what we can see, as you can see, uh, there's uh, lots of uh, news about uh, um, heritage uh, building. For example, uh, we have uh, Sultan Bersamad building and a series of buildings nearby. Uh, there was a fire uh, happens uh, in one of the buildings there. And then also we have uh, some uh, building where uh, the communist leaders and Tunku Abdul Harman met uh, in Baling. The, the building was in a very bad shape. So all those are the, 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 the things that we have to reassess. What are the, the outcomes of the management? Whether we manage it correctly or wrongly? Okay, and then uh, if we manage it uh, properly, the building, uh, we, we will extend the lifespan of the building and we preserve the value, the historical value of, of the asset. So in, in effective management, you will shorten the lifespan and you decrease the heritage values uh, and then uh, you have to spend more money, unexpected significant spending. More money we have to spend to make good. Yeah? And also, of course, you breach uh, statutory obligation under Act 645 and also under uh, the NHX Act and everything. Yeah? Okay, so we go to the next slide. Okay, uh, you can see the photo from the aerial photo eh, from here. Mm. The uh, Medan Bandar Alusta. For the first uh, few slides, you, you, I think you you saw the dataran, you know, uh, with a lot of grass. Okay, lots of grass. It looks nice from from uh, aerial view, but actually down there under the grass, there's a lot of uh, water clogged, damage, everything. And under this uh, this three acres. Uh, Dataran, there's a lot of services but you don't see it. Yeah. So Majlis Bandar Al Ustar has uh, uh, appointed uh, my company with uh, other consultants uh, to to do to propose a rejuvenation of this uh, padang. Eh? Or last time they call it padang because it's just located in front of the uh, istana. Eh? Istana where there were, in 1904 there was an event uh, a wedding of uh, of the sultan's uh, children i think four couples you know four couples four four couples of his children uh, got married together uh, at the same time and they have like a, a three months event i think in, in, on this padang yeah, in front of masjid zahir on the top but across the road is masjid zahir all right uh okay when i uh, mentioned about the technology and uh, i just want to go back to this slide again i highlighted uh, documentation in blue color because uh, that uh, uh, phase of uh, managing the asset is for me is uh, a very tough uh, phase because uh, there's a lot of, of issues uh, arise. Uh, one thing is that uh, how to properly uh, document the uh, the asset, the old asset, uh, a, a very delicate asset. For example, uh, okay, uh, we go back to this building. You see the roof tiles there. It's a very old tile. Some of them are new tiles, you know, but I think 90% of it, a very old tile. Okay. And then uh, if you see the foundation from the excavation, they don't, they, at that time, they don't have uh, any uh, concrete piles, you know. Uh, they use uh, a brick, a very thick brick. They, they, uh, they arrange a brick. So on that brick, I think it's special made brick. There's a stem. Uh, with uh, the word Kedah uh, written in in Jawi, yeah, in Jawi inscription, it mentioned Kedah, there. and uh, so a lot of things eh, we have to document it properly. 
So I, from my experience, uh, my uh, civil and structural engineer and few other engineers, you know, they went up to the building. We we, we rented a crane, you know, so that uh, people can go up uh, to the roof. But I dare not go to the roof because I think it's it's too risky to to be there. But uh, a few people they just walk on the on the roof. I think that is dangerous. One is dangerous to the the safety and the health of of the professional involved. And another thing is you uh, increase the exposure of damage, eh? damaging the the asset. Yeah, it's not easy to get a replacement of tile. Yeah, and on, uh, another thing is was when they uh, went into the ceiling space eh? uh, to check on the roof trusses uh, and then the ceiling uh, and then the timber because they use a hundred percent timber. So when they walked there, the ceiling was made of uh, of, uh, of uh, wood, you know, a timber, uh, and then uh, they rot, you know, lots of uh, rotten uh, timber there. So uh, instead of uh, you know getting a, a good uh, documentation out of it, you know, we just just use photograph, you know, a camera to get the photograph of it. So the inaccuracy was not there. So the problem is uh, you risk uh, the, the safety and health of the professional. And then also you tend to damage the asset and then you will get inaccurate uh, uh, measurement. Uh, those are the things that really bother me uh, when, we, when I work on the uh, heritage uh, conservation work. That's why I feel like I need to talk about that, uh, that, that, that documentation part, you know, other than uh, other phases of the process. Okay, so in this case, we have uh, new technologies, uh, you know, to document uh, assets. Uh, it can be in a building survey, in architecture, in heritage conservation or in landscape, in site surveying, it's almost, it used almost the same thing. If you can see eh, the photo here, we use, um, we use drone to take that photo, but it's just a camera on drone, but we don't have a scanner or anything at that time. So we can take this photo, but we don't get a real measurement out of it. That's the, 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 the thing that is lacking you know, in this process. Another thing is that uh, that, will, uh, that process will cost you uh, will involve costs, a lot of costs, yeah, for using uh, laser scanners, uh, you know. So uh, sometimes the uh, client doesn't want to spend much yeah, on that. The, this is the minister, eh, Minister of Tourism, uh, in my case, because uh, they have a certain budget already for that. So uh, when we propose to use this uh, laser scanning or that and they have to reject it because of the budget is, was already in place. Eh? So they cannot have an extra budget for it. Okay, uh, so you look at the uh, left, the top left photo. That is an iconic uh, structure for Alusta the fountain. On top of it is a tanja, eh? tanja of Sultan Abdul Halim. Then that tanja can revolve. It revolves like 24 hours. Uh, a day and it will turn to a certain uh, uh, direction according to time time uh, of of uh, azan i think okay so we have uh, it was uh, constructed in 1984 so i i i worked on this project in 2015 so that was already 31 years old uh, fountain is still in good condition structurally but uh, on uh, the surface, eh, they they use um, they use uh, uh, ceramic tiles, you know, all chips and broken. So you have to uh, measure properly. So to do that, we have to use crane, you know, uh, with extended uh, arm, so that we have to we go we reach out to to the tanja there, and then two people went in to that to that crane. I think that is very dangerous. But we have to do that 
because uh, we want to fix the the mechanical parts of the uh, tanja as well and then also uh, because in our proposal we want to uh, clear this padang from uh, a soggy uh, soil uh, and uh, unkempt plants so we have to clear the whole thing and i have to propose uh, another material that can last for maybe 100 200 years you know from now so the choice was to use granite for the whole of the area uh, in the first place uh, we got uh, uh, lots of uh, complaints lots of comments from people surrounding from people from everywhere but uh, after the project completed uh, we can see uh, uh, our success we don't have a proper measurement of that success but from what we see uh, year in and year out there's a lot of uh, program that we have planned happen in this uh, uh, on this uh, padang especially uh, during the uh, point uh, the coronation of uh, the new sultan sultan salahuddin uh, and then there's also uh, 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 tour di Langkawi, one of the stop is here and uh, during uh, Ramadan uh, 30 days they have a buka puasa on this uh, padang and a lot of other things happening here and if you go there at any time or any day you can see couples taking photograph or wedding photograph at once there are 20 couples everywhere uh, spread you know around on, on this uh, dataran taking photos it's so lively so and uh, there's one event they call it uh, Kedah Berselawat it happens uh, the, the event uh, happens uh, in Masjid Zahir but it's spread out all the way to this uh, dataran and according to the source, to the, to the reliable source, uh, Majlis Bandar al Star, there were 10,000 people uh, attending that uh, event. So I think those are the things that uh, as a, a conservator or as an architect who, who is doing the conservation work, I myself is not a conservator because uh, I feel like I have to be an architect who knows uh, about conservation. Conservator can be other people, you know, like Prof. Gaffa is a conservator. Uh, I don't want to have a conflict you know, between architecture and conservation, or, you know, conservator and architect. So architect is doing architectural work, but he has to know about conservation. Okay. Uh, okay, next. Okay. Kimulu, how many, uh, how, mo how much more time do I have? Uh, you have about 20 more minutes. 20? Mm. Okay, good. Okay, why is the uh, documentation of heritage uh, uh, and historic building important? Okay, one of it is it is uh, the principal way uh, to give meaning, understanding, definition, recognition of values and your cultural heritage. Yeah, if you, if you follow a proper uh, uh, guideline uh, by what is time you know we have to do uh heritage architecture building survey you know heads one heads two heads three so you have to document everything before during after yeah so uh normally the conservator will do it but we have to understand what the uh, how the conservator do the work yeah so we can do it as well yeah? okay and number two is uh this is um it may be undertaken as an aid, eh? as an aid to various intervention. So we call it intervention, which is protection, or we just restore. We don't do a, a total uh, uh, conservation. You know, some we restore a part of it, or we just protect. You know, the the damage damage area, and we want to do the identification of uh, materials, the monitoring, interpretation, and also the management of historic sites. And building, so that's why you need uh, a good and proper documentation, a precise documentation. Okay, and one thing, uh, another thing is that it is a key to documenting structures. Yeah, structures that are important because they illustrate the advancement 
uh, in uh, construction. Okay, advancement in uh, construction uh, method for architectural design, and also uh, number four is documentation tool have undergone major transformation eh, over twenty years, primarily due to advent of PC and advanced solid state electronics. When I first uh, enter into this construction world in early 90s, 93, 94, I worked with a Kumpulan Architect at that time. So we first worked on AutoCAD, release 8 or 9, something like that. Okay. And then from there, there we saw uh, the events of uh, so many uh, software, you know, uh, until now we have BIM. Okay. And uh, not many people understand what BIM is, but we are in BIM era, okay? So we have gone through that. That, that, that 20 years is basically uh, I and some and those who uh, who uh, born, you know, around my 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 the time that I was born, they have gone through all this uh, phase, eh? the 20, 20 to 25 years uh, span. So from from uh, PC with DOS, now we go to a very uh, solid state uh, electronic. Where from iPhone, the latest one, uh, iPhone 12 Pro, it has a lidar, you know, light detection and ra and, and ranging. We're gonna talk about it uh, uh, later. Okay, that is very advanced. You know, using just a small 5,000 ringgit phone, you can use lidar. Okay, so we see what what the uh, lidar uh, can be can help you in your work. Okay, so we go to the next one. Okay, there are three techniques available uh, for the uh, documentations of uh, heritage asset. One is graphic documentation. Okay, all architectural students uh, doing this uh, in the in their study. Uh, we go to and do a. a a manual survey, uh, hand measuring, uh, and then the main application of the method are building survey, building analysis. Yeah, so uh, you climb to the rooftop, you know, just to measure it. And when it comes advanced a bit, uh, you use um, the the scanner, I think made by Bosch, eh, to uh, a laser la laser uh, uh, measuring tape, something like that. I, I don't I don't really use it. Okay. And so uh, you use hand measurement and you draw it on a, a drawing, like a blueprint. So as a simple method technique for a small and non-complex object, this is okay. Yeah, for a small house, for for a small like the the, the one that I did, eh, the balai seni, that is not small. You know, but uh, we have to live with it. We have to use the uh, the. Uh, uh, a normal uh, graphic documentation where you measure it, you draw it, so you print it on, uh, you use AutoCAD and then you print it. But the accuracy is not that good, yeah. Especially when there is uh, when dealing with details on the beam, uh, on the columns, and details on the uh, facade of the building. So, uh, however, as a simple method, okay. However, is it is time consuming, you know, you're doing a graphic documentation is very time consuming. I think uh, all of us who are architectural students, used to be architectural students, or now uh, architects or practicing architects or lecturers uh, teaching architecture, we still have to deal with this with students. Eh? So it's very time consuming and not accurate. And it's very extensive, you know, the, the, the effort. So sometimes you get mad when you see a student's drawing eh, after a uh, few weeks of uh, uh, field trip and then they come back and they come they come up with a very poor inaccurate hand drawn uh, or a uh, cat drawing so it, it's either you have in, it, if you do it professionally it's either you have to go back or you have to hire someone to do it yeah okay so and high risk on health and safety of the professional so the tendency that you will fall from the rooftop or from the roof through the ceiling down to the floor, yeah, and it happens, it happens yeah, to many students, 
because uh, sometimes they want to show off. Eh? They just climb, and suddenly they step on something that is rotten, they fall down. And it's also high exposure of damaging the delicate heritage and historic building and structure. Another one is to use a theodolite eh? and something similar to that. Uh, it's quite difficult also, especially if you have a complex form with a large number of points, eh? not easy to use a theodolite. And not many architects, students or architects can use theodolite. Yeah, uh, that is true. Okay, so okay, these are the example of manual hand measurement and you know, you have to, to set up properly, make sure your setup is correct, and then you have to draw. It's very tedious work. But we used to live with that, with this kind of uh, life. Right? Okay, uh, number two is photography. You use photography. Eh? Use photograph. So uh, excuse me, Dato. Sorry, to interrupt. Uh, sorry, Dato. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you have yeah. another five minutes. Uh, correction just now. Five minutes, okay. You have another five minutes. Okay, so five minutes. Eh? Yes. Okay, we use photography where sometimes. Um, in all days, uh, we took lots of photos and then we combine the photos. Uh, those are photography techniques. And from photography, we have photogrammetry. Yeah? Pho photogrammetry is a process where you take like, like for this uh, structures here, you take uh, like hundreds of photos and then you loaded it into uh, a software. And then the software will combine everything for you and you form a 3D, 3D uh, image. Where it's very accurate, but um, it has it involves photography. Yeah? Whether you use drone to take that photograph, you use camera. Okay, so I go uh, uh, quickly. Yeah? And then the, the third one, okay, this is uh, the photogrammetry. Yeah? You use drone, you put the camera there, and it takes uh, like hundreds of photos, and then you come back, back come back to the office, load, load the, all the photos into the software. Then it will stitch for you everything. This is uh, on your left. That is uh, photogrammetry uh, image. It's a 3D, very accurate. It's very, uh, and and not that expensive compared to the to the laser scanning that we're going to see afterward. Yeah. So if you use a uh, photogrammetry, for example, uh, it costs you five thousand USD. If you use laser scanner, maybe sixty or seventy thousand USD. So that's the, the difference. Uh, but uh, laser scanning has much more uh, sophisticated uh, application. Okay, this one, the, the, the third one is uh, you use a 3D laser scanner. Eh? So those are the laser scanner where the scanner is in the middle. It will rotate, you know, how many million times a minute. It, it takes uh, all the photos eh, using laser. So you see the brand eh, from Leica, Leica laser scanner, Trimble laser scanner. Those are the, the brand. Eh. Like if you use a SketchUp, last time you used to take, uh, you used to take uh, uh, a, a library from, uh, from what uh, company? Now you take from Trimble. If you use a uh, SketchUp, you take the library, you go to Trimble. Okay, that is, is, is Okay, they, they produce uh, uh, LiDAR, you know, light detection ranging. Light detection ranging is more, much more advanced than radar. Eh? Radar is also a uh, detection and ranging. Okay, so this one, uh, the 3D scanner, it will scan, you know, from exterior and from interior. Uh, for, the, for the roof, either you, you go on a scaffolding or you go on to, to other top uh, uh, high building to scan the building that you want to scan, eh, the roof of the uh, second building. Or you can use drone as well, you know, but it's very expensive. Okay, so these are the scanner by Ferro. It's another brand. Eh? So that is uh, how, how you scan the interior of the uh, hall. Okay. Okay, so uh, after you get this, uh, we, I'm not going to talk about him. I think everybody knows about BIM, whether you have used it or not, but you have heard about BIM. Eh? BIM is a standard uh, planning method to create 3D uh, models eh, by a professional. A single BIM model can encompass an entire site. 
complete with physical and functional characteristics. So BIM is all about collaboration between stakeholders, engineers, architects, surveyors, all work on one uh, model. Everybody can chip in, yeah? So each stakeholder can insert, extract, update, so everybody will get the, the latest one. So the value of BIM stakeholders can work together using carefully coordinated model more effectively. That's how BIM is. So uh, you can learn BIM from PAM or from uh, CIDB. Okay, now we combine laser scanning and BIM. So we call it, the, the industry call it scan to BIM. So you scan, you push it to BIM. Okay, you, you use laser scanner, you pass it to BIM. Use laser scanner to capture uh, high density points of buildings, yeah, for example. And then uh, uh, 3D laser scanning device, for example, terrestrial laser scanner. Terrestrial is uh, meaning Earth, eh? Earth laser scanner. Uh, and mobile mapping can take millions of measurements in very fast. Uh, and many uh, different types of laser scanning. One is LIDAR, light detection and ranging, or SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, it's more on the survey. Huh? And scan to beam deploy 3D laser scanner on location to build a precise point point cloud huh? data set and model. Okay, okay, this is an example of scan to beam. You scan the delicate, the intricate uh, details inside uh, the church. Because the church normally church has lots of <laughs> detailing right, inside there, eh? which is not easy to, to draw. If we do it manually, yeah, we put a paper and then we use a carbon pencil you know, and then we, we draw. So I think uh, architect student knows about it. So it's very difficult, but this one is you use laser scanner. It will scan the whole of the interior. And then from there, we transfer to BIM. BIM will process it into a 3D model. Okay. Okay, this is the difference between photogrammetry and LIDAR using drone. On your right is LIDAR. Where it scan the whole site, it penetrates down the the vegetation. Whereas the photogrammetry is, you take hundreds of photos. You can use drone as well. Yeah. So that's uh, the 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 it's comparison between photogrammetry versus lidar. Okay, this one uh, I credit to Masiana, Masiana in Japan. They just have the uh, uh, they have a simultaneous uh, program with us today in Japan in Tokyo. So this one, I, I, I got it from, from the, the slide just now. Okay, it happens around 11 o'clock this morning. So this is the process huh? from laser scanning. Okay, you use uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. Okay, and then you go to recording with drone. And then you come up with uh, 3D point clouds that I mentioned just now. And then next, this is what you get. Okay, even though your building will be demolished tomorrow, you have a complete uh, set of document where you can use uh, you can use um, a scanner, uh, a printer, a three D printer to print this building to its size, piece, piece by piece, bit by bit, or small size. Or you can rebuild uh, the building somewhere one, uh, using the information that you have in. A few more minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm finishing. I'm finishing. Okay, okay. I'm finishing. Okay. So this is the benefit of, of uh, scan to beam. Eh? So fewer errors. So uh, scan to beam provide the quality assurance. You know, so that you 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 don't uh, create more errors. Then uh, so quality assured. Eh? New construction project in sensitive or challenging location. Uh, you don't disturb much of, of uh, other buildings nearby, you know. So you just put a scanner everywhere uh, in a few locations and you just scan, you, know, you get all the data that you want. And asset and facility managers of all properties can take advantage of efficiency improvement that BIM already delivers. So BIM will process everything for you. You, know, you can reduce the carbon footprint by identifying uh, where we, we need the better insulation, you know, because they, it will detect, you know. Uh, and then uh, reporting fault for ongoing maintenance become more precise. And this is uh, scan beam the process. Okay, first you scan on the left, and then you transfer it to beam. Then beam will process into a model, 3D model, exactly to what you see on site. Okay, uh, where is it? Okay, this is the impact of modern technology on documentation. 
and that was my that was my my last slide okay uh be patient with me uh, and look okay impact of modern technology on documentation of product eh? number one is uh the rapid evolution of documentation techniques and tools so every day we can see uh, a new uh product on uh, documentation of uh, 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 uh techniques and tools we have a laser scanner we have a beam then we have scan to beam last time we have photogrammetry okay it's evolve almost every day number two to achieve a real comparison between this method the cost we have to to, ju to juggle between cost and time uh, complexity level of the project accuracy that is required for the project and what are the monitoring issues those are the parameters that we have to set that's why for my project i think it's very uh, critical because uh, our building in alosta was already 100 years at that time 100 100 and 10 years but uh, the client says okay this is the budget that they have no more so we have to live with it number three laser scanning has the main advantage of allowing the acquisition of dense data with high accuracy high speed flexible okay and number four documentation is not only needed for proper conservation but for more to raise public awareness because we can use a 3D model and then we can have a virtual uh, uh, travel where people can come see and you know they can see the building in its, re in its real uh, uh, figure and also for example uh, we, we have a, 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 a digital drawing of a Sultan Abdul Samad building for example and we can scan everything we keep it in 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 uh, uh in the digital form or we have a masjid negara building in digital form if anything happen for example earthquake happen in malaysia it demolish everything eh? it damage everything we can just rebuild using the data that we have you know we can build models first from that beam uh, data and then we can rebuild almost any building parliament building or uh, Tugu Negara, uh, you know, everything we can do it. So the user should now accept that they have to deal in the field with new documentation instead of hand measuring and tachometry. Okay, and then the last was the specialized technician and non technician. Um, you know, they don't have to worry like, about the precision and accuracy, but they have to just uh, just fo forget uh, focus on the standard of 3D, the interactivity of the multimedia, you know, you want to share with other consultants. So with that, uh, I think that's the end of my presentation. I'm so sorry, I have to go uh, fast forward eh? <laughs> because the time is so short. There's so much thing to discuss, to, to, to share. Okay, so we wait for the question and answer. All right, thank you, Kitai Muluk. Thank you Back very much, you. Dr. Kitai Zukari, <laughs> Mazin. So um, I think uh, to cut uh, short of the time, anyone who have any question, you can type the question in the dialog box, you know, in the chat box. So while uh, Akita Elvin is presenting his uh, paper, uh, uh, Dato Akita Zuhairi can uh, answer the, the, the question or concern uh, uh, in, in the chat. Eh? Okay, uh, next speaker, we have uh, Architect Elvin. He currently serves as the Vice President of PAM and heading the initiatives such as the PAM Convention and the PAM Academy. He's also the past Honorary Secretary of Architect Regional of Asia, Acacia, uh, and also past Honorary Secretary of Architecture for Humanity KL Chapter. Uh, he has served as PAM's representative to various national and regional organizations such as the Acacia, Acacia Committee for Professional Practice, LAM Council of Architectural Accreditation and Education uh, Malaysia, various CIDB committees and the Standard Industry Safety and Health Assessment System in Construction. I first know him when I was uh, doing part-time lecturing in Inkowin, way, way back, I think almost 15 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to hand the, hand the uh, floor to uh, Architect Alvin. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Architect uh, Abdul Muluk, a uh, good friend of mine. Uh, okay, I'll share screen now. Uh, here's a 
that she had this creep that this way. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, uh, thank you, Ray Yato, for a very, very engaging uh, talk about the topic of heritage. Uh, our app and then thank you. historic architecture. Uh, we, I think we talked about the past, the historic architecture and the technologies of the future that we can use to, to help us uh, document the past. Uh, I have a more mundane topic to talk about. I think uh, I thought you were talking about just then some issues that was uh, plaguing the uh, industry in uh, doing heritage and um, architecture. I talk about uh, how to manage assets, uh, talking about the danger of uh, documenting the assets, uh, talking about uh, you know, you're climbing up roofs, using cranes to, to, to document uh, and measure buildings. Uh, so in this very mundane uh, talk that we have, we talk about now, we talk about yeah, the work that we do in preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, Reconstruction, uh, implementation of architectural works, uh, heritage architectural works, yeah. Uh, and we talk about, say, what are the basic principles of it? Uh, uh, I think time is running a bit short, so I probably just won't read through all the, the top uh, points that is up on the screen. Uh, so you just talk about the basic principles and standards of conservation, you know, recording, you know, uh, talking about fabrics, uh, looking at the risks. Uh, the intervention, uh, retention to, of the uh, original structures, uh, respect of quality of space, yeah, longevity of the finished work, preference for original material workmanship. So when we talk about uh, the implementation of the heritage architectural works, we, we first you know, we talk about like uh, in in uh, the one that uh, Dr. was talking about in terms of safety. So we are talking today about safety uh, at the workplace. So um, what do you talk about? How do you do it for safety? I think um, every one of us uh, doing architecture would know that when we talk about um, health and safety for occupants of the building, it's all governed by UBBL. Uh, so the UBBL tell us what to do, how to do it, and all that stuff. And, but we also must also think about the people that helps us build these buildings and, and or uh, after that maintain it. So for the people who, who does that, there is this, uh, uh, what is called, act called OSHIM. Yeah? OSHIM, I will do, uh, elaborate further about it afterwards. Yeah? So when you talk about workplace health and safety for heritage building, uh, we talk about risk associated, uh, should be identified from the front, at the front, I think what Datu was mentioning, uh, when you go and document building. Yeah. So for, yeah, in terms of safety, first you need to look at identifying the hazards, uh, what could cause harm, uh, assessing all the risks, controlling the risks, uh, reviewing the control measures, and document it, because it's the most, effective, uh, most important thing to document it, so that it's transferred through from the start in the initiating the project to the designers, yeah, to the, the uh, implementation and the contractors and the management of the assets that they're on. So uh, in terms of the part of the uh, uh, workplace health and safety for heritage buildings, uh, you look at uh, existing base building, yeah, electrical wiring is one of the big issues, uh, walkways and staircases. You know, there's, uh, if you look at a lot of these uh, heritage buildings, a lot of the Walkways are not even, you know, even tongues are not even. You know, it's it's, it's, it's uh, staircase, sometimes narrow, sometimes uh, uneven. Uh, it's always uh, room for accidents to happen. Uh, yeah, so indoor air quality, especially if buildings are uh, abandoned for a long time, uh, closed off, yeah? uh, and also uh, using of uh, hazardous materials like asbestos, lead. And everything in in, in the past, uh, asbestos and lead in paint is quite common. Yeah. So then uh, manual handling of uh, materials, uh, 
high risk. High risk in high risk is one big big risk. Uh, risk of structural failure, risk of neglect or non maintenance. And the objective is to provide achieve a maximum level of protection for health and safety for the building uh, occupants and or people who are working on the building. Okay. So uh, previously our uh, guidelines for construction sites uh, are governed by the guidelines uh, under occupational uh, safety and health. Uh, uh, it's called OSHA. Uh, I think that this is version 207, I think it's 94. Uh, and currently we have moved on to a uh, system called Occupational Safety and Health Infrastructure Industry in Bracket Management. Uh, this is, the, I think the latest version is 2017, uh, which is now currently being distributed for public comments. So after that, it will be uh, mandated to be uh, implemented on site, for all sites. Uh, uh, so this session, the objective is to uh, introduce to uh, our viewers here, uh, what our duties are, uh, duty holders duties, uh, design, and what do you do in terms of creating principle for designing uh, with risk management in mind. Uh, okay, so these are the content that we will be touching on. Uh, I'm not too sure I have time to finish all of that, but the slides will be there. Uh, you can uh, refer to uh, if you cannot finish the, the slides. Uh, so, okay, introduction, Osh, I think if you look at the uh, compa comparison, uh, with some of the developed countries in Australia, New Zealand, US, Hong Kong, India, Singapore, we rank the worst in terms of uh, construction fatality and accident rates. Uh, in, in, in the, you can see the chart is uh, up here right now. So we are looking at uh, ranking uh, the, the worst in comparison for the one that is shown on the, on the screen. And also in terms of year by year, we are increasing in terms of our accident rates. I think you can see that in our newspapers, and news uh, tasks, uh, cranes falling down, people falling off the lane and all that stuff. I think uh, the government has looked into it and find it unacceptable. And, and DOSH has complained that they aren't able to enforce uh, OSHA before because it's, it's, they do not have the uh, manpower to do it. If you look at the uh, statistics that they have, you have about in 2019, 14,000 uh, TAPA active, active sites, yeah? 75,000 contractors, only 100 plus DOS inspectors. Yeah? So they, they cannot go around and inspect all the sites. So, what they've done, they have done after, uh, since then is or since 2015, 2006, culminating into 2017, create uh, the ocean, yeah, uh, to, to distribute ownership of risks, yeah, to everybody in the construction industry. Okay. So this is the guidelines uh, issued 2017. Uh, guidelines to occupational safety and health for construction industry, bracket management. Uh, it's currently been distributed for uh, public comments. So if you can get a copy of that, uh, you can go through it. Um, I think what they've identified is, is since uh, the construction industry is such an um, increasing in scale complexity in terms of innovation, uh, and then you do a program the schedules and costs and all that complexity has increased so much that uh, the risk of uh, the risk being the responsibility of the risk to control the risk uh, cannot be pushed to the one person the contractor alone. Yeah, that's what they say. Okay. So, so OSHA has moved the emphasis uh, to all the individuals to improve management of safety and health. Uh, to make explicit what is required from the employer. Uh, okay, the duty holders. Uh, so to, to try to, I'm not trying to 
uh, how to, to explain all the duty holders because you've got uh, clients, you've got contractors, you've got designers, you've got uh, all the consultants. So we'll just talk about people who are related, I mean, roles that are related to us and get us architects. So, okay, now the under this uh, OSHIM is basically uh, based on the UK Construction Design and Management CDM regulation. And in, in that uh, uh, regulation, the duty holders define designers as uh, people who main duty is to eliminate, reduce, control uh, foreseeable risks that may arise in uh, construction work or in the use of the building and maintaining the building once it's built. Uh, designers, uh, this is the, the definition of designers. Designers work under the control of principal designers if there's more than one contractor. So if, for example, you've got phases, so you've got phase one, one designer is controlling it, and phase two, another designer is controlling, then it's a principal designer that creates all these designs. Yeah, so the principal designer's main duty is to manage, monitor, and coordinate the health and safety of these phases. Okay, next. Uh, so this is the matrix uh, summary of what the designer do and what the principal designer do. Okay. Now, uh, so it, it, there will be one question most people will ask me: yeah? uh, Who are designers? Yeah, designers is defined here as the person who prepares and modifies design of construction projects, uh, including design of temporary works. Now, this is uh, different from the architect. The designer here talks about the designer of the safety and health uh, matters. Yeah? So it's like temporary structures, uh, scaffoldings, uh, hoardings, all these things, all the matters that relate to health and uh, safety. Okay. And same thing with the principal uh, designers. Uh, and the principal designers is on control for the picture phases of the project at the very earliest stage through right from before feasibility, uh, through the planning and delivery of the construction work. The principal uh, designer will be liaising with the client to talk about all this risk. Now, I'm not saying that we as architect cannot be the principal designer or designer. We can, yeah, but it's not part of the work scope that we do as a architect. This is a work scope under OSHIM. So they so under OSHIM is we call the designers if we want to take on that responsibility. Okay. So under uh, OSHIM, this is uh, under OSHA, yeah, uh, so 1994, you've got this start of the uh, occupational health and uh, safety and health uh, in management uh, from here. We talked about pre-construction, liaising with the designers and then construction stage. So basically they will start a health and safety file, construction information, and then construction phase. Now, under next one, under OCEAN, uh, it goes a little bit more thorough in terms of the flow. Yeah, You will start off the client, even in a brief, yeah, will give all the uh, conditions, all the requirements, and you'll start, the designer will start looking at the site, the, the, the bare site itself, in terms of what the possibility of uh, risk of uh, dangerous uh, or possible risk of uh, accidents happening and all that stuff. So even before they start designing, yeah, the, in the under the feasibility studies, the, this, the designer of safety and health would come in and look at the site already. So it's under pre-construction. So when the concept design comes out, they will review it again. Detail design comes out, they will review it again. Tender, they will review it again until it's ready for uh, construction. Okay. Then when the con principal contractor comes in, uh, the principal designers and principal contractor will sit down and look through all the possibilities so that you will try to mitigate any risk of uh, any accidents happening on site. So once that's finished, 
yeah, they, they'll pass on this baby to the operation to maintenance stage uh, people. Okay, now uh, if you look at this uh, gra graphic, uh, the most important thing is to look at the arrow at the bottom. Now, uh, they are, uh, this ocean would require you to start documenting all these risks yeah, in a safety and health file. It's like your, uh, uh, I don't know, your passport or birth cert. You, you will open a file when you start the project and start going through all this. Uh, every review will go and be filed under the safety and health file. And at the end, it will be passed on from the schematic stage to the design stage to the tender stage and then passed on to the contractor for implementation. And this file will be passed on to the operations and maintenance so they know uh, what to look forward to in terms of where the risks are, are in a design like this, they're building, yeah, they're done. Okay, so in terms of heritage building, uh, like I said earlier, uh, the initial stage, uh, in, in initial stages in site evaluation, documentation, you are looking at existing conditions of building site, buildings and site. Uh, you're talking about looking at possibility of non-compliant design in terms of uneven floor, upward staircase, uneven uh, rises, uh, uh, non-compliant materials and lead and vessels, you know, restricted access, access uh, like working at height and confined spaces. You know, a lot of old buildings have that. Uh, very high ceiling, roof, very high roof to, to, uh, to get, right, get into the roof space. Uh, and obviously, the very importantly, the dilap uh, dilapidation status. You know, like what uh, Dr. Hussain just said. If you don't have that dilapidation status, then you don't know you will step on the Roof joist and then everything will fall in. Yeah, and not only you fit the work, the work get fit, and the building also get fit. Yeah, so this is a heritage building. We try to uh, maintain as much as possible in this original status. Yeah, in detailed design stages, you are looking at uh, the effect of fire risks in the building. For example, if you have high uh, pressure fire hose wheels, uh, the fire hose may may damage the glass of the, the windows or the plastic ceilings or plastic on walls uh, so we may have to look at designing non-damaging uh, fire control system now in the construction, uh, construction stage look at uh, obviously normal ppe uh, safety restraints harnesses to uh, doing construction especially uh, in terms of looking at height uh, protection of existing uh, conditions of site uh, we're looking at uh, definitely looking at uh, vulnerable structures, yeah, so that you need propping up and strengthening. Uh, and when you need uh, scaffolds, you you cannot like attach it to the, the building because you know, a lot of these build, uh, buildings have, don't have RC you know, structures where you can uh, to, to, to attach to. So you have to be self supporting stuff. Um, so if you look at the post construction stage, uh, very importantly, once you hand over to the uh, people who are using it and maintaining it, like what Datu was saying, managing the asset. Yeah, how do you, you must have all this passed through to the people so that they can have a proper plan to manage the asset. Okay, story about Ocean. Uh, there are a lot of people, you got client, designers, uh, contractors, and the, uh, the uh, maintenance people. Uh, so what we we'll want to talk about is just designers. Yeah. So the designers will be preparing, modifying designs. I think they look at design in terms of uh, the possibility of the design having a uh, risk of uh, it creating uh, unsafe uh, spaces. Yeah? Taking into account uh, principle of prevention, uh, taking into account pre-constructing information, eliminating and reducing foreseeable risk to the design and uh, making clients aware that these uh, risks uh, exist and, and obviously the client will have to decide one way or the other um, to either to accept the risk or uh, mitigate the risk. Yeah? Provide information to uh, principal designers uh, cooperating with other DT uh, The responsibility of designers are yeah, you know, prepare, 
prepare pre-construction uh, information yeah, for principal designers, uh, eliminate foreseeable uh, safety and health risks, to reduce control, reduce all control and risks. Okay, design information uh, to pass on to the uh, principal designers uh, with for inclusion in the pre-construction uh, information and the uh, safety and health file. The client and contractor uh, will help to comply, comply with the duties to ensure that the uh, construction phase plan is prepared. Okay, so then to communicate with all other designers and contractors about the risks. Uh, the principal designer will coordinate all this if there's more than one designer inside. Okay. So we'll just skip all that because it's uh, we'll going through that. I think uh, one of the, we we'll give you like, some examples of uh, uh, the risk that we're talking about. Yeah? Uh, some like say, for example, if you're at height, uh, you know, if you're a two story, three story building, you can't clean the windows outside. How do you clean the windows outside? Uh, uh, if you look at um, uh, risk, if you look at the uh, design, the way to put the access, access hole, access manholes, and if you want to access the roof, like what Dato was saying, how do you have access uh, to the roof? You can't just climb it you know, freestyling. You need to be able to uh, have some uh, structures for you to attach your harness to. Yeah. Uh, obviously, also we're talking about site management as well. To, uh, Allow adequate room for delivery and storage of material, yeah. specification of items associated with the open wall or panel systems that would be able to attach your scaffolds to. So, what is what? Five more minutes. Time uh, up. Okay, I'll quickly go through it. <laughs> okay, uh, cost benefit, uh, it will reduce accidents on site, improve management procedures, improve productivity, improve quality. So, it look at the key elements of ocean is managing the risk, appointing the right people. Yeah, uh, make sure that every duty holder communicate with each other, making sure everybody has the information, and consulting with workers and contractors to promote effective measures to secure safety and health and well. Okay, so in terms of benefit, you can see that uh, in even in CDM in UK, uh, in ten years of uh, CDM. In, there's an improvement of 30% of the annual statistics of fatalities. Yeah. So basically what we're trying to say is if you need to uh, balance uh, our uh, economic and managerial aspects of the project management with the concern for uh, social and ethical concerns for the safety of the workers. Okay. So and what they're trying to say in, in this is, if we look at it, uh, the ability to influence safety, yeah, is very very easy when you start the project. Yeah. High, it's very high when you start the project. Everything can be documented. You can identify the risk and easily design for it. But as far when when building get built and all that, then it's start to get less and less easy to uh, mitigate this uh, safety influence on safety. Okay. So the hierarchy, uh, the design hierarchy of all the uh, ocean is you have a few ways to mitigate this. One, the most important one, uh, is to uh, to to make sure that it you design all this uh, risk out of uh, the, the the building, and obviously eradicate, uh, replace reduce and if you can't do all that then you have to have uh, uh, contr uh, engineering control administrative control or uh, provide personnel and people people to, to, to help control it yeah so conclusion uh safety and health management will add a cost to any project uh, but i think uh, what was uh, identified earlier was um, it's almost just 2% of the construction cost uh, to, to create this uh, management of health and safety. Yeah. Uh, that would reduce greatly the, the, the danger 
to the people who are helping us create, uh, build this uh, all our buildings uh, that we, we design. Uh, in in this context, we talk about heritage building to maintain, to to renovate, to to, to conserve uh, the historic uh, buildings that we have. So. Uh, uh, Basically, what we're trying to say is that yeah, we're not we're not the only one uh, working on this goal on these projects. Let's just look after the workers as well. Uh, so this will come in soon. It will be mandatory. Uh, so we, I hope you all just uh, go through the documents that I highlighted earlier, so that you are making yourself aware of what is uh, required under this uh, act. And uh, there is also a specification in CIS 27 that is issued by CIDB that uh, uh, advises us what to uh, put in our BQ to, to, to allow for this design uh, for, for risk in mind. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Architect Elvin. Uh, uh, sorry to cut you short uh, in your presentation uh, yeah. because we need to finish our session at 3.30 and uh, we want to allow the, pan, uh, the participants to uh, ask some questions. Sure. Okay, uh, we already have one question uh, by uh, Shahira Shaharuddin here. I think uh, Dato has already answered on your behalf. It's regarding the uh you know uh organization at the site i think akita alvin maybe you want to add something to that questions i don't know i have i've been doing a presentation i haven't seen question yet uh, let me ah yeah the questions uh uh she was asking about uh uh the design team the design team yes sorry i can't see the the question uh hold on uh you click on the chat okay chat button, to, yeah? i'm trying to Oh, I have to stop sharing first, sorry. Oh. <laughs> sorry, didn't stop sharing. Okay, all right. Okay, now what are you saying? Uh, what's the question again? The design team. team will be, the team will be called design team looking at the design sector and department. The principal designer will be the architect uh, if he or she is the registered architect. Uh, this is slightly different. Uh, so, um, this That's is my answer design, to, to her. Yeah, this is yeah. the design team uh, uh, of our, our, the designer of our design team. Uh, when under OSHIM, the designer is the designer of the health and safety uh, controls. Yeah, so it's not so much the designer of the building. Yeah, so they could be designing the uh, scaffoldings, designing the uh, uh, platforms, safety, <laughs> safety platforms, and all that stuff. So it, it, it's uh, I, I know I've already highlighted to them that this is very confusing <laughs> because everybody assumes that designer is us, the architects. But they say the designer in under ocean is the designer of the safety protocols. Yeah. And I architects will be called the architects, not designers. So meaning that it's not the uh, same as the uh, project architect. Uh... We will be called the architects. It, we could be the one doing it. We could be the one doing it. If you are if you are well versed with the the, yeah. the ocean itself, you can do it. Uh, obviously, you uh, obviously can can can. Uh, 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 you don't do it. <laughs> because you have to be vigilant. You have to be vigilant, you know, all the time on uh, on site, right? Correct. So I think we don't have much time or uh, time to look, uh, you know, for the whole site. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have other things to do. Let so let the let the the respective person handle it. Yeah. Correct, correct, yes. I see. So, okay, uh, I think uh, we uh, have answered, again. Uh, uh, all this will be also question. supervised by the uh, uh, SSO on site. Sorry? And she was asking that all this would be the also. And head officer on site? On site. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, yes. Yes, the, the health and safety officer on site. There will be the supervision will be the health and safety officer with uh, who is from the contractor. Yeah. Right, so we're under uh, construction, the contractor. Will, yeah, under construction, yeah. the SHO uh, will be the one responsible of checking through. It still be same, but what we're doing under OSHIM is um, 
dragging this process through from the inception of the uh, design of the building yeah? so that we look at the uh, possible risk at the design stage, not just at the construction stage. Mm -hmm. So we, we will, uh, Elvin, are we yeah. responsible uh, for uh, uh, for the design? If there is anything happen on site, are they going to are they going to pinpoint on us as well? Uh, yes. <laughs> when you say that, that no, I mean uh, when you say that that, that design uh, does not consider, you know, how they are going to build it. For example, you design something. Uh, uh, getting out here, you know, oh, so it, it will be very difficult to to construct, and then uh, a worker fall from from uh, that area. Then are you going to be responsible? Okay, no, the idea is not so much uh, eradicate. It, you, you you won't be able to eradicate all these risks. It's to mitigate it. It's to uh, mm -hmm. make sure that they are aware. So the contractors, if you say this is a very difficult wall, slanting wall to build then you make sure that they are aware this is difficult. Then you be aware you provide the proper uh, uh, controls to help you uh, build this wall yeah, and mitigate the, the dangerous situation. Mm. Uh, yeah. But so, I think, uh, Alvin, this one is uh, quite difficult to be implemented on, like, for example, conservation side, you know, like uh, the one that uh, in Dato, uh, uh, example just now. You know, uh, it would it will be it will be implemented for all projects, all projects. So it, heritage is one of them. I think in heritage, the easier easy part is uh, what's it easy, but the more the more dominant part is the pre-construction stage when you start documenting the building. When you start mm -hmm. documenting the building, you don't know what you're seeing. Like that's what I was saying. Yeah, your roof <laughs> could be yes, could yes. be rotting. You know, you could. Set up there, you know, and yeah. set kilos, boom, can you come down from the ceiling? Yeah, so that would be the danger. Yeah, so you need to be able to yeah. take care and make sure that if, yeah, there is some uh, steps and controls taken to, yeah. to help you do your documentation of the uh, evaluating the building. You know, because initially when I uh, agreed to uh, mod moderate uh, this session, I find it very uh, uh, strange that uh, you know heritage and you know heritage and safety was put together in one session. Okay. So now I can see the connection. <laughs> Actually, uh, very much uh, involves safety yeah. when you are yeah. doing the conservation on uh, you know especially the cons uh, conservation exactly. side because yeah. it's involved, uh, Especially what like what Dato in, in his presentation uh, has mentioned. You know, he, he said, it's a dangerous uh, job to just document old buildings. Yeah, it, you don't know what's in there. Yes. You don't know if the, yeah. Structure oh, uh, like very, uh, for very example, very uh, uh, you structure... mentioned about the uh, high cost of uh, employing this digital or uh, or technology to do the uh, digitization of the old buildings. So uh, how do we mitigate that in terms of uh, when we approach our client and asking for add additional budget to do this for the sake of safety, for example? Do you have any anything to share with us? What I can see now is that uh, we, we have to create an awareness, you know, uh, and then we have to team up with the stakeholders. We have to team right. up with the CIDB. You know, CIDB right. has to inform the contractors, because sometimes there's a design and build project, you know, for this uh, specialized job of uh, conservation. So the contractor must understand that there's a need of uh, of uh, having this uh, digital uh, scanning, you know, laser scanning, because otherwise contractor will just squeeze everything yeah, for profit. So yeah. sacrificing our, our life as a professional, you know, we are the mm -hmm. one who is going to be inside that building and yeah. the workers. So the contractor is just uh, saying at home, you know, calculating money and what to invest. <laughs> you know? So uh, okay, awareness. Think, uh, the for, uh, we have yeah. about uh, and I think two, Pam, two more minutes uh, left. Okay. So I want to take the last question here. Uh, in pre-construction before contractor is appointed, how does this designer came in given okay. that he is under the contract uh, contractors of HSO? Okay, it's not. Uh, yeah. uh, the designer is not under the contractor's uh, health and the safety officer now. 
It's not. Because if you, what I've shown you is all what is related to us only in terms of our design stage and our uh, uh, pre-design stage. Uh, the client also has a, a part to play in this. Uh, their responsibility is upon the inception of the project, they are supposed to hire a designer or a principal designer for health and safety. These are the people who would start off and look at the site and start away document say, okay, this site is at the corner of the corner of a heavy, heavy traffic, you know, it's, you, know, you can, cannot get in and out and all that stuff, what's the danger? No place to put, uh, what do you call, uh, materials. They will start looking at that straight away, even before architect can come in. They, they, they can do that, yeah. What okay. they're trying to do is to get this, uh, get this into a, a situation where everyone now is aware that uh, designing risks out of our building is everyone's job, not just the contractor. Okay. Mm. So it's a follow up with uh, another question. So he is another consultant, I, yes. uh, I think. Yes. yes. Which we can take on the job as well. So we'll be the other consultant. But I don't advise you to have the same guy being the architect and the designer. Mm -hmm. You may have in your office a different guy doing this, uh, the, the, the ocean, and another guy doing the design so that you, you know the demarcation yeah. of, of uh, your role. Same, mm -hmm. Right. Same thing when I mentioned uh, in one project, uh, uh, an architect shouldn't be a, a conservator as well. Yes, true. That would be a very, yeah. very conflict of interest. Yeah. You know? yes. a, a, It'll be confusing for people. Yes. You know, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, we are running out of time. So I need to end the session because another session is starting in 15 minutes time. So I want to thank everyone who come to uh, uh, attend this uh, CPD talk. Uh, I want to especially thank the two speaker that has uh, given us uh, a lot of uh, new information for me at least. You know, uh, actually more information definitely come up with more questions. So I think we can arrange for another session maybe. Uh, some of you maybe know Dato uh, and also architect Elvin personally. So you can approach them directly, uh, you know, through PAM or directly to, to their uh, uh, emails and contact. So we can have a, a further dialogue about this. If, uh, if there is a request for it, we can always start another CPD, uh, full session of CPD on this matter because uh, it, it's coming because at the moment it's already distributed for public comment. Uh, and you know, once public comment is come in, they will gazette it and make it mandatory. So at the moment, I get to answer, I think Shahira here, is it mandatory to engage designer under consideration work right now? It's not yet, but it's coming. Okay, all right. And, uh, let me add, uh, <laughs> uh, you all can uh, also uh, join the PAM uh, Heritage and Conservation Committee. Yeah. Okay, yeah. promoting yes. the Headed by our program, program here. here. Headed by yeah, our yeah. program here. <laughs> right, right, and, and Steven, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you very much everyone. Uh, thank you again for uh, supporting uh, PAM program. I think uh, uh, we have uh, a few more sessions left for today. So uh, please uh, keep yourself updated with the program uh, that uh, we uh, we prepare for this year, uh, either face-to-face -face or online, uh, you know, via our uh, PAM website and also our uh, social media uh, 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 things. Okay, so uh, thank you very much again for everyone. So with this one, I, I will end the session. Uh, and hope to you, see you in other session. Thank you, thank you, thank moderator. You. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. See you Bye. in the next session. Well done, Dato. Nice job. Do we have a photo session? Okay. Take some snapshot. I think the uh, Pam also has taken some snapshot. Uh, okay, okay, smile, everyone. Uh, photo session, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank okay, you. Hold on, yeah. Hold on, yeah. Hold on, yes. Okay, one, two, three. Can we get the participant in? No? No. <laughs> this one. Only the panelist. Ah, not okay. as in. Thank you, thank you all for attending. Yeah, thank you all the participants for attending. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Akitai Mulu. Thank you, Dato. Thank you for all supporting us. Uh, yeah. uh, Event. Uh, yeah, I, I will be moderating another session after this. Okay, uh, have fun. Party.
Najib, with Najib, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, PM, right? Uh -huh. I think uh, you are welcome to join if you yes. have done. I will join. When it comes to architect Najib, he always come up with a very controversial and interesting uh, uh, statement and idea. <laughs> so I'm also looking forward to that. Yes, yes. All right, thank you yeah, very much. He just, you, uh, he just finished with uh, HCC just now. Oh, I see. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, the, 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 the organizer, uh, am I still in this room or exit the room? Uh, I will end the session now. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. They will kick us out. You don't have to do they will kick us <laughs> out. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Who can give us the link for Najib Sun? Uh, I don't know. I think uh, uh, Nani is going to give Yeah, I'll, I'll text Nani. Thank you. Uh,